Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to another episode of the Frame by Frame podcast, your podcast for all things UX and UI. Uh, right, so we're going to go jump straight into the theme for today and that is passion projects and collaboration. Collaboration probably being one of the most important words to any UX design or UI product or indeed any workers uh, toolkit because without collaboration it can be very hard to get projects completed and we regardless of whether there are personal issues or not with people we have to be professional and we have to work with people so it can't be underestimated uh, saying that uh, collaboration is important it is arguably the most important right now what are passion projects this is something that was brought up when we were discussing what to discuss for this week's episode and why they're important. And following on from that, we will be discussing, <laughs> discussing collaboration with peers and its importance. So, passion projects. All right, guys. So, for you two, what would you say is a passion project of yours? I wonder if we all forgot how to unmute ourselves. Uh, for me, it's just doing something that is not directly related to my pay, or maybe that's a poor description. Uh, maybe working on a project or product that just interests me just for the sake of interest. Um, maybe I do get paid for it, but that's not the primary results I get out of it. Um, maybe this thing is related to like, a purely pleasure related interest like a tv show i like or something like that or a video game or maybe i enjoy learning and i just want to work on something to improve my skills uh, just anything i do where my primary um, reward from it is just the the feel good chemicals of yes i get to work on this thing zach what about you uh i did actually forget to unmute myself earlier um <laughs> uh my current primary passion project I've been working on for well, six and a half months, seven months now, maybe a little longer. Um, it's also a collaboration piece with another former student at Career Foundry. Um, we've worked on a couple things together, but this one is the longest running. Like we set up, it was three months. We did all the UX and now we're just going through and like, experimenting with different ui styles and then the last two times we've gotten together we've gone over like some of the ux research and evaluated where we could maybe have more or do something a little better but that's also a point of a passion project is hopefully you're in no rush with it um it should be something that you a, enjoy doing um and if you're working with other people make sure it's people you can work with. I've, I've had one experience on a project. Um, it was solely for experimentation, but two of the six of us uh, did not get along with pretty much anybody else. And um, yeah, it didn't go really well at the end. And then there was uh, a few things that happened in the process where almost the rest of the group realized like we couldn't work with this person, even if we had to, like it, it just wouldn't, it was never going to happen that way. And, uh, we finished it on our own, but it was, it was a good experience to have, uh, uh, in remaining cordial with somebody you're still required, not required, but yeah, you're sure. still working with. Um, while at the same time, there was an end to it, um, prematurely for them, but it was, uh, you know, that's something they figured out too. Maybe they figured out they couldn't, they weren't good at uh, hearing even constructive feedback or they weren't um, capable of collaborating on specific things with people because they have to do it their way. Or, yeah, that's usually, I think in a group, that's usually a problem, a, a big problem that comes up often is um, being pliable. Like, that's one thing in collaboration, especially if it's not a, even in a serious project, but you, you should be able to be a little bit moldable 
and adjustable because again that's yeah, a course. ux thing you have to learn to adjust quickly sometimes to certain things and uh that's another part of why you should probably do collaboration and passion projects is because a you're gonna up your skills and b you're gonna up people skills and your own personal like emotional and um professional intelligence uh, gets improved by working with other people but uh it's really important, especially in a work atmosphere. Like you don't have to be the easygoing guy and never disagree with somebody, but you learn to disagree better. Like mm -hmm. you learn to discuss your, your differences of opinion or whatever in a higher value way so that nobody's sh nobody should be offended. But, uh, yeah, it, uh, I don't know. My current project is, is going great. It's getting me, um, it's allowing me to play around with some styles that I'm interested in and never get to use. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I can also talk about, uh, collaboration projects. I mean, I collaborated with, uh, with, uh, with a fellow career foundry alumni, uh, probably about month two months ago we worked on a classic car project and of course i like classic cars although not to the point where i would go to a classic car show i'm more interested in classic cars as in just dr driving riding around in them but it was really fun uh it was just a two two-man job and we worked together really well we did have some disagreements but not disagreements as in uh, we couldn't work with each other it was more just on concepts and and stuff like that so for example i'm more sort of i don't i would don't want to say traditional but i was i don't know i guess i have more of what i call a uh what's the sort of a practical point or perhaps uh ideas that might be seen as a little outdated but we worked well together. We we didn't we disagreed, but we also came to a compromise. And I think that's a thing that's important. I don't think anyone is necessarily right. I think it's more a case of working together and finding common ground. I think once you find common ground, then the little details that people in your team don't agree with, I think become irrelevant. So for me, that was a passion project. It was, and I think with, with a passion project, you, I don't think you would tend to disagree as much because you're more into it. You're more eager to see this project that is reflective of one of your passions through to the end. I would say it's definitely more likely that you will work better with people which i think comes back to you have to enjoy your career if you don't enjoy it you're not going to be as amenable to reason or another person's point of view i mean we all get it in our hobbies sometimes with our hobbies if we're just not into it we don't praise ourselves as much and we criticize ourselves if i'm doing if i'm having a bad game of bowling for example if I'm already in a good mood when I'm going there and I'm looking forward to it and I have a bad frame, I don't think anything of it. But if I'm having a bad day, I focus more on getting frustrated with having a bad frame than doing a, I don't know, a, a seven ten split. So I think it's really important that people enjoy what they want to do in order to give their best. I don't know if you guys um, have anything to, to add on that. Yeah, um, I think that's a good a good um, thing to add on is a passion project should ultimately just be, it can even be just a random idea you had, but if you are interested in it and it sparks your creative um, juices at that point, then, then make something for it. Like I made a random social media for superheroes app and I called it Masks. And, uh, That's the funny. whole point, the whole point was, I mean, I'm sure some, most of our viewers have seen kick ass and if not, I re highly recommend it. Love um, that movie. Yeah. So it's kind of along that idea where if you're a local superhero, you can go in this app and people, people can request your help like an Uber. And, uh, 
it was super fun. It was just for fun, but that was the point. Is like it wasn't serious, and it was just to play around. But it let me use some cool color styles and some cool illustration styles. And doing the UX on it was fun because a lot of like the people that I actually questioned about, like, hey, so in theory, if you like had this alter ego and imagine this to be real life and you wanted to call uh, or people to be able to call you for help. And then the other half of the people I asked, like, okay, if there was actually superheroes like located around you, would you use an app for that? And so a passion project should just be something that lets you play around. You, you get your kicks off of it. And you know, that's, that's the whole point. And some of those projects I've actually looked through some portfolios and those are the ones that really stand out. It sounds like they also really yeah. help you being like imaginative because like that you can't interview superheroes to see if they would use it, but or can you like what you said, <laughs> you can say, tell people like, Hey, if you had, if you were a vigilante or superhero and you had a secret identity, here are my questions for you. But also you can go to like policemen or firemen or like emergency responders who like, I'm sure it would be a similar situation for them. It's not a social media, but like people call in when there are emergencies. I, uh, I mean, they might not have a reason to use the app because they get phone calls, but they could probably shed some light on like the issues of receiving communication from people, like uh, the problems with phones that maybe you could solve with the app. So that's it's pretty cool that you could really flex imagination that way. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... For sure. Sorry, Zach, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. I was just agreeing. Yeah. How do we think that, not just on projects we've worked on or, or we may be working on now, but how do you think when it comes to passion projects and, and collaboration, how it can lead to innovation and self-discovery? So, for example, perhaps you work with one, two, three or more people and you're not just building a project let's not forget that you're not just building a project you're building a camaraderie a rapport and of course the more you work with people the more you understand each other of course disagreements will still come up from time to time that's that's normal because everyone is different but how do you reckon that it can lead to innovation, self-discovery, not just in design? I mean, yes, that is the main point, but also in terms of self-discovery and collaboration in order to improve yourself, or or even if it's the other way, maybe you're too shy to argue a point when you could really have a good idea, but you're intimidated. How do we think that can work with innovation, self-discovery, not just in design, but in collaboration as well? Um, so a lot of, a lot of the good ideas that have come out of, when I'm working with other people to cover the collaboration side, a lot of the great ideas that, that get thought up are actually sometimes started by a disagreement or not even a disagreement, but maybe a different view of how something should be. And I think if both people are willing to bend a little you can merge ideas and from from a merged idea you get some crazy stuff that comes out and it's actually probably some of the best things to spark the solution to whatever you're solving or to you know you might find that next market best because two people had two different ideas but were willing to meld them together and then what came out of that was even better and so um, I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said for working with other people and how that can help you with a project, but professionally it's, it, it, working on passion projects alone, like forces you to exercise that creativity and that problem solving, um, you know, and yes, it is different from working in the real world where you have like a guideline book by your company and stakeholders, and this is what they want and need. And this is what your users want and need. Sometimes a passion project, um, you can f focus solely on the problem and the people with that problem. So therefore there is no middleman 
playing between you know the user and the product like you're literally designing it for them it's it's your project there's no money in on it you're not going to lose anything and worst case is you come up with an idea that's meh like maybe it didn't work so good but it's it got that out of your brain like um i i like to do a workshop i did this when i first started at my company with a couple people and um i was I basically asked for all the ideas that could get us fired, like for pitching them. I was like, give me the worst I still love that possible exercise. idea. And uh, we basically got out, you get the bad ones out of the way. And then it leaves the room to think and work and innovate. And um, yeah, in the process, you are confronted with people not liking an idea or you not liking an idea or you know, and, th and then that's where the collaboration, uh, experience comes in because, okay, I'm willing to bend, like, I'm not stuck on an idea. Tell me what's, tell me why you think the solution is better or show me why, like sketch it out real quick on a paper, explain it to me. And I will happily take that argument and roll with it. Like, let's do this. Um, I think that's also important in collaboration and it'll help you grow as a person because, you know, I'm, I'm into my particular, I'm, I'm biased. I like my particular design styles. I think they're, they're great. Am I permanently sold on one? No, you'll never get me to stick to one forever, but I do prefer some over others. And, um, it's good to work with other people who may have differing views on what they enjoy to use or to design with. And, sometimes those those experiences are great because yes you have your preferred but now you're getting experience maybe because you bent on an idea and now you're using something that they prefer and you're learning to work with it and incorporate what you like about yours with that and that's that's really where innovation will take over like you're you know you didn't get the flat design that's still sticking around because nobody worked together to innovate on ideas for me, when it comes to like innovation being created through collaboration, uh, I think one of the primary ways that I've experienced it is just that every time I work with someone new, I learn a new tool. So when I first graduated from Career Foundry and I did a couple different exercises with other grads, I found out about designer size for the first time. That's the like cool um, prompt generating website that really helps you uh, flex your thinking muscles. I think we've talked about it before on the podcast. Yeah, it's the eight bit. I love that thing mm -hmm. that's in my my pinned pinned tabs. I, uh, I also learned about Bubble.io and other visual app builders that like you don't need to know code to build an app. Um, I haven't really dove very deep on that yet, but I know it's an option available to me now that I can innovate with in the future. I also did a little bit of research into learning management systems um, when I did a a like collaboration project with other CF grads on Google Classroom. Um, so like now, if I wanted to do anything in that area, I know what LMS means now. I know what it is. I know what to search for. Um, so just hearing about new things has been a massive uh, boon to anything I do in the future. Of course, you learn new things based on your own research and based on any sort of paid work as well. Um, but I probably heard of all this new stuff way quicker working with other people than I would have on my own. Absolutely, because you, let's face it, everybody's stuck in their ways. At some point, you find what you like and you keep using it. That's why I will never stop using Illustrator. I love Adobe Illustrator. I've used it for forever. It is a good product, so there's obviously alternatives out there but i'm not gonna switch at this point i'm lazy why should i learn another tool when adobe illustrator is more than enough um but again if if i work with other designers or illustrators i do hear about other programs i just don't use them because I, it's uh to me i'm not going to but again it's great that another person sees it as a tool discovery use like to collaborate with other people because in ux design there's so many tools there's so many things i've talked to you will but and and cross about where it's um 
programs where I'm like, I, I think I've heard of that. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, regarding just to come back to your point, I wanted to make uh, a couple of minutes ago was um, how it's not always, I don't think it's always bad to have, I don't want to say rigid, but to have sort of have a set way of doing things because that could also be incorporated as being part of your personal branding. I mean, we look at, uh, you know, you don't have to be a, an expert in trad- uh, classic paintings to tell the difference between uh, Van Gogh or Da Vinci or anything. You just know that that's someone's style <laughs> based on just the way it's portrayed. I mean, I don't think Da Vinci would have done things as the same as, uh, well, Van Gogh or anything like that. So I think it's not entirely a bad thing, but then we've, this is something that leads on to something we've briefly touched upon in a previous episode. And that is how, where, where is the line drawn between sticking to something that, that, you know, works, or at least it's functional and adapting it because it's actually stale, that it's a design that is really old fashioned that doesn't work anymore. How do you, how do we get that distinction between keeping what we know and applying it yet at the same time, being open to the fact that what we know or a part of what we know is no longer relevant. How do we determine that? It's obviously styles. I mean, any industry is going to keep growing. Um, I mean, look at cars, for example. If you took a car from even 30 years ago and put it next to one from today, the materials are different. The cars run obviously different. Uh, Definitely efficiency has improved, um, but the materials, I mean, some of the old Buicks, man, you could plow through a tree and nothing happens to that car. It's steel. It's it's (laughs) a steel vehicle, but in the same sense, you now are talking gas mileage, so fuel consumption. Um, you're talking emissions. Like those cars were terrible uh, as far as their emissions. And um, yeah, it's, uh, for me, it's not even a green thing. I mean, look at motorcycles. Motorcycles have moved to the e-bike. It's just not in the way Germans know an e-bike. It's an e-dirt bike. Um, but their power output is phenomenal it it beats you know the the bikes of my time and the two strokes um yeah obviously there's downsides to it but the technology advances and companies and people have to adapt look at look at design if i was still designing stuff i mean the style has been mixed and reused and now it's coming back into style due to fashion but you know the 90s the 90s style is coming back, but you, you're you not going to see me putting Saved by the Bell style backgrounds on any of my websites because it is a fad and it will change. And I think it'll change relatively quick over a long-standing design style such as like flat design or... Um, yeah, I don't... See, I, I saw a thing the other day about flat design and everybody's like, is it finally over? And it's like, no... You'll see it modified, but I think it works too well across multiple platforms. You'll never see it change. So yeah, if something's going to be, um, you know, considered obsolete, not obsolete, but it's just not relevant anymore. Um, yeah, you can't turn Google back into the original Google. Like it's never going to work. And if you're releasing a new product, I like the old Google complexity and functionality loss over simplicity and fully functional. Yeah. I'll take the fully functional. Um, it's, but that's, you know, I would never hand my grandfather a Mac today and have him like how it is because he was a, he was a windows guy. He hated Macs. Um, sounds like he, uh, sounds like he was quite a, a wise man. I mean, don't get me wrong, Windows is not perfect, but I've only ever used Windows, so I think if I had met your grandfather, I think he'd have taken a shine to me, because I only use Windows. 
my grandfather was I know about Linus, in the like... creation of the first spacesuit, and he then mm-hmm. went to UPS and developed their computing system for international shipping. Um, he didn't know how to use computers, and he told his boss at UPS at the time that he thought he could do it, just give him the book about the computer they were using. And he went home and figured it out, and then ever since then he was he would buy a computer and read the manual cover to cover and then he would go online and see how to work with that system manipulate that system change that system do what he wanted to he was that guy um but you would never guess looking at this guy uh but yeah no i couldn't hand him a mac now and him be like oh i really like this he would hate it he would hate the style he likes he wouldn't have liked the new Google, but at the same time, he understood the need for it. I mean, he was an innovator. That was his, his life, but he had his styles that he enjoyed. So obviously if he would be the guy who's not against the new style, but if you can give me an option to change how I'm viewing the, the UI, can, can I have that please? Um, <laughs> You know, dark light mode, he would be somebody who was like, if I can make this flat design go away, it'd be nice to have a beveled edge somewhere. But you'll never see computers go back to that. It's, we've come too far and the displays are changing. The way things are, it, look at AR. I mean, you have the, the Apple goggles that came out and now you're using spatial views it's still that flat design style, but I see where that'll be where the flat design changes and you'll start to get depth, but it will only be used when it's in spatial design. It's the only way that it'll look good. Wow. There, there are goggles just for seeing apples. Uh, yes. Farmers, um, with, you know, sight, sight, uh, handicaps needed them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess if I guess if if they're, they they can't see red and green if they're colorblind, I suppose these Apple goggles are really something. Yeah, I mean, uh, why not put apples in your living room just by sitting there? But uh, again, it's technology that is taking over. I mean, look at how many kids are getting VR goggles, which I think are dangerous to sell. But that's just me. Um, yeah, I, I I'm a big I don't mind VR actually. Sorry to interrupt. Just just because you mentioned it, I, I, I've only played VR once. That was about seven years ago in a pub, and uh, obviously, you know, it might not sound much, but I've, it's developed a lot since then. But I think it, it was pretty cool where you have it because I, as you know, we all all of us have played the Nintendo Wii where you have the wireless and you have the joy pads and you move. But this was really something because you're wearing an actual headset and you are immersed in a completely fantasy world. And I always wanted to play the original Metal Gear Solid, but as Solid Snake. But um, I haven't played AR since then, actually. I haven't done anything like that. Um, Yeah. But it's interesting. I have read some things about it, and uh, it's scary how it can make someone think that something is really real. Yeah, it's, you know, it's uh, a powerful thing, but that's one reason I do like virtual reality. I think it's cool. The gaming world, yeah, super. Um, Please be in an enclosed room that has nothing else in it. Like, if you're going (laughs) to smash it, like, it's... You know, it's, it's like I, I, it, it, I find it dangerous. It's like that people... scene. It's like that scene from Johnny English. Have you guys seen all of the Johnny English films? No, I've I don't heard think so. of them. Uh, you've you've got well. Even if you don't see the film on uh, on YouTube, there's a clip where Johnny English, played by Rowan Atkinson, is doing AR virtual reality. And the thing is, he's got the gog- He's got the goggles on the headset but he misswipes the screen. So instead of being on a platform that's a rolling platform, he actually leaves the platform and simultaneously it switches between what he's seeing and where he actually is. And it's brilliant. And he basically, just in a nutshell, he's attacking a guard in the virtual world, but 
he's actually beating up a London City Tour bus tour guide. And he pushes a granny in a wheelchair out of a shop because he, in the virtual world he actually pushes a henchman. And he picks up these weapons to beat up another henchman. And it's actually, he's picked up a couple of baguettes and he's beating this worker in a bakery. And then at the end of it, you just see all of the carnage he's caused. So, yeah, I think definitely with VR, AR, you've got to be in a secure place for sure. Yeah, I think AR still has its dangers, but the fact that it's you're able to see your surroundings. So I'm a big fan of the gaming world taking more of an approach like, like AR where... Um, I like tower defense games. So, I mean, if my, my goggles or whatever I have to put on at that point, um, wants to display my tower defense game on my living room furniture, that's cool. Like I'll take that. Um, yeah. But do we think, do we think since we've mentioned, um, AR and virtual reality, and obviously we've mentioned AI to death in previous episodes, but do we think that it's possible that you could collaborate with people around the world in a way where you're it feels as though you're in the same room so let's say we're doing some blue sky thinking we're a bunch of ux and ui designers we're, we're in a room we'd, we'd, we've got to do some blue sky thinking some brainstorming and of course we're actually in our living rooms or someone's at a starbucks and other ones at their parents and so on and so forth but if you have the headset and you plug it in do we think that that is actually a possibility where to the point where you feel as if you are all collaborating in person in one room? How, Absolutely. and if so, I mean, if that, at, if that is a possibility, webcams. yeah, look at webcams, yeah. look at FaceTime. So as we, I was just mentioning with AR, you have, you have Apple goggles, um, augmented reality so it's the spatial reality where yeah. you can see yeah, through the goggles spatial. it's almost a hologram at that point but i mean if you include a camera from an outside view of your body it would totally be possible for this to spatially put the other person where you're sitting in your room because if they're sitting and have a camera on them and that's what it's displaying on your screen so to them you're in their living room to you they're in your living room but the space around you can also be augmented and so you basically yeah. have Figma fig jam in your living room with the rest of your team. So you would actually be able to feel like you're somewhere with your team collaborating. And those are, they totally have to be being thought of right now. Like this is not the first oh, time somebody absolutely. Spit, spit those words out. Um, but no, it's, yeah. it's absolutely possible. Yeah. And it's, I mean, the thing is, yeah, we do have, Oh, excuse me. We do have webcams and everything. We've had them, well, donkey's years now. But of course, you know that you're in the screen, that they're only pixels on a screen. Um, not to <laughs> dehumanize anyone, but they are just pixels on the screen. And you've got that spatial awareness that you're in your bedroom or you're in your office space or you're in your living room or you're in Starbucks. But to actually have that sensation of them being... of your collaborators being in the same room uh i i it, it, it's scary but at the same time it's also mildly exciting because you think wow you would never have to meet anyone again i mean if it gets so realistic in the event that there's another pandemic you'd be able to do everything well almost everything that you can in person without having to, uh, the risk of catching a, a a pandemic. Yeah, there's totally legitimate use cases for it. Um, team collaboration is definitely one. So I look forward to a future where I can mentor somebody, and you know, my my workspace includes that person, even if it's digitally, because again, you lack body language. Like right now we're doing our podcast. There is no video that's, we lack body language and body communication. Um, it's harder to read people. That's why sometimes we have pauses between talking because 
you don't realize like the person had finished or they sometimes their their body language signifies that and um collaborating with a team i mean we i just got back from a work event a couple of weeks ago and um ran a workshop there that was super fun it was great and i i love all the people i work with and uh yeah there's nothing like being in the same room in front of a wall or whiteboard where you can really like get down and dirty with some problem solving and it's super fun like especially if you enjoy uh like collaboration hour and you just that's what you do that's what you're there for and it you know it in our workshop that we did it did get heated at some points but again professionally we all deal with each other very well and uh at the end everybody laughed laugh uh, left the room laughing um with all our problems at least on paper with a proposed solution if it wasn't already thought out and uh yeah, again, um, for me, my job, I, I like what I do. I really like what we're making. Uh, would it be something I do if I wasn't working there? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, it's to me, it's not a product or any, a project I would have even thought of. Um, so I can't say I wouldn't have worked on it. I mean, I've done some really weird personal projects just for fun. Um, like I did egg fishionado was a kind of a New York Times style flip page of just uh, fancy photos of eggs. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I've had weird ideas, but no, collaborating like that would, it would be unbeatable with remote work. Like it would literally probably be tops for remote work because it makes more sense to me. Okay, Teams meetings, I hate them. I hate being called into meetings. But even, um, you know, when I have a UX team meeting or a UI team meeting or there's a problem that comes up, it'd be nice to call a meeting with three people. And even though we do this already and we discuss and we have video capability, it's one thing to be immersed in a room where you can digitally throw sticky notes up in the air and see them all and everybody's seeing the same thing. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. And so it's one step closer at that point to in-person collaboration. But um, I think the capabilities also lean really well for any designer at that point. But new designers will definitely have a, a better experience later if they're able to do stuff like that. I think um, passion projects alone are going to change immensely if AR goes into play. Think of all the things you could do all the crazy ideas you have that may be possible in AR, why not start designing them now? Like that's a great way to find a passion project you're hooked on. Like, yeah, why not? If you think it's possible, try to design it. That's a good way to do it. And if you can utilize AR in the future to do that with other people, I highly recommend that. Um, especially for, you know, maybe there's another pandemic someday, who knows, but yeah. Yeah, well, there there may well be uh, another pandemic. I mean, I mean, this is why just I don't read the news because it's either a war, pandemic, or something else, just something miserable, you know. But uh, I think, uh, I mean, unlike AI, I'm a bit more receptive to what augmented reality and virtual reality can do. I mean, for me, AR would be perfect because I'm. I'm at the point where I'm not interested really in, you know, seeing the rest of the world or, you know, doing lots of new things or anything like that. So for me, augmented reality, goggles, virtual reality, headsets would actually make it, would be really convenient for me. Um, I mean, I don't think there's ever, no matter how close to reality it might be, I don't think there's any substitute for actual reality. I mean, walking, uh, because for example, if you're walking through a park or a forest and it's a cold winter's day, I don't know whether it's possible now, whether it's, although no, although doubtless it's being considered, but if you walk in a, through a park in a, in a, virtual reality world or augmented reality you're not going to feel the cold you're not necessarily going to feel the rain so i don't think there's any 
they'll ever be, no matter how good the technology will be, I don't think there will, ev there will ever be any technology that can simulate the cold unless, of course, you go into suits like exoskeletons or virtual reality or augmented reality body suits where it stimulates the sensation of the cold or the snow or the rain. Uh, mind you, I should imagine that that kind of technology would, well, it would cost billions because of how acute and sophisticated it would be. Yeah, I mean, I've seen people that own jet simulators in, that's their fun. They fly jet simulators and they have a giant jet simulator in their basement instead of a, a home theater. Um, so, I mean, yeah, sure. If the technology is there, why won't somebody spend money on a room they can experience? It? Maybe, you know, I, I don't know the term for it. Oh, there's a huge echo going on. Um, not sure what's going on. Um, but yeah, all the, I don't see why somebody wouldn't, if they have the money or the capability is there, why somebody wouldn't build that. People literally have jet simulator, like a thing that tips, tilts and spins around and you wear the goggles and it looks like a cockpit. Um, people have bowling alleys in their home. So I don't know the term for it, but what is it when you're afraid to go outside? Um, Agoraphobic. Yeah, and you will be able to give those people an experience that they they won't otherwise have. So if you're able to even offer that and somebody can pay for that, yes, of course, it's the people that could pay for that. Um, but yeah, they'll be. Able I think to it would be something. I think it would be useful. I mean, I always wanted to, for example, go on the Crusaders tour. So going to Jerusalem, Jaffa, Acre, and all that. Now, of course, I wouldn't go there now, but it would be nice to be able to have that ability to put on a headset. And it's so realistic, although it's not 100%, because uh, I don't think it, it, it can't ever be that. I mean, there's one thing that augmented reality and virtual reality c won't ever be able to fully simulate. Even if you are immersed for something in something for too long, like uh, walking through a park or you're doing a jet, uh, you're, you're piloting a jet. There's one thing that it will never, um, and actually I think it's, I think this is, it's going to, I think it, it could be dangerous by removing the sense of danger. Because if you're piloting a plane in a virtual world, even if you've got a, a replica of a plane, you know, you you can always come back to the reality that you've not actually crashed a plane or you've not actually gone somewhere and you're soaking wet or, or, or anything like that. So do we think that the dark side of, of this, um, I know, I know we've, we've, we've sort of gone a bit of a drift of collaboration, but I think it's important and I, and I can actually bring it round back to collaboration after saying this is, do we not think that, if people who, I mean, I, I don't consider myself agoraphobic. For me, it, 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 it's a choice. I just prefer to, to stay in these days. But for people where it's not so much a choice, it's more of a fear. Do we think that more people, regardless of whether they have a fear, could actually be more isolated regarding that? And if so, does that mean that collaboration could actually be in danger of not being there as much? Or do we think that collaboration will just change according to the times, which also applies for design as well? What do you guys think? I think it will change. Um, it already has with remote. Like People are just used to meetings now. We have a Teams meeting. If we're going to have a design meeting, we meet in Fig Jam. If it, you know, it's, it happens. That's, that's how it's going. As far as, again, um, you know, uh, here's a great idea for anybody listening to this episode about um, passion projects. Develop something like that. To tr be the one to pioneer that technology. Because I feel like people who are afraid to go outside, if it does feel real, and yes, that you're eliminating that feeling of fear at some point because they know that there's no danger, 
what if it can be actually used the opposite and used to help them um, transition into actually leaving again? So it would be, you know, an expensive process, obviously, but you could build like an acclimation chamber and you start introduce like you introduce these people back into the outside world. So there's sound, there's light, there's, you know, the, the feeling of being outside or wind or whatever, however it works, you can treat these people this way. So they, their brain immediately, the first 10 times, maybe even longer, will still respond the same way to that environment because they are afraid and they will go in there and that sensation is there. And despite how smart we are, your brain will always revert back to your caveman instincts under fear or stress. And I think it's a really good way that you can slowly try to at least try to get like a, a treatment for it instead of actually dragging people out the door in front of trucks and cars. Like that is scary. Maybe it works. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't treat that, but I think solutions like that are actually great for the technology. But as far as collaboration and stuff, um, I don't think it'll hurt it as much as we think. I think it takes the, some aspects of communication out. Like there is no actual touch anymore. There's no actual, um, being in front of somebody. Uh, but even with augmented reality or virtual reality, where you can sit in a room, you're coming close again, you're taking the, the human out of the thing. Cause it's still all in the computer. Um, but we have to adapt. There's no going back on that. I think we just have to have to adapt to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the, the, I think there are pros and cons, swings and roundabouts, ebbs and flows with all of this stuff. Because on one hand, it could be yes, it may make people more isolated. But on the other hand, besides having four fingers and a thumb, it could also be that it's a sort of training, the same way that we did UX design, the same way that we learn how to walk, how to talk. It's a, it's a training in order to get us prepared. And I think it could also be applied for that. I mean, let's say you've got someone, a colleague who's really agoraphobic. Uh, they, they are really uncomfortable when it comes to people, not because the people have done anything wrong. Maybe it's a previous experience. But if you can train someone with this kind of technology and and they know that they're physically they don't have to be there, it is there is still a wall or a barrier, but men but then that, that barrier could be broken down. So therefore I think that yeah, it, it could be a good thing. But like with any kind of technology, you'll get people who will use it with good intentions and people who will use it with bad intentions. But I do think that there needs to be a limit. I think there needs to be limits on everything for, well, for our, collectively for our own safety and sanity. But I, d I don't think it would be a good idea to simulate reality of dangerous situations. I mean, people who aren't trained at rock climbing, if they do virtual reality enough, it may give them a false sense of being an expert. So they try it and then obviously something happens or maybe there's a fatality. Which is why I, I do agree with limits. I mean, even in collaboration, I think that there has to be limits because otherwise nothing would get done. If everyone is discussing, someone's pontificating, another person's trying to say their point, I think it can actually be detrimental. So it's just really a case of, of limits, I think. But ultimately, it's better to collaborate a little more than than to not because at least then you've got, still got a chance of finding common ground i think i mean did you guys have any closing thoughts on on that or anything we've we've covered or any advice or information for our listeners out there before we wrap up uh if you're doing a collaboration project um of course if it's something you're like really passionate about go do that thing and if the people you're with are passionate about it too go do your thing if you're doing a collaboration project that's not also a passion, but just to get some experience under your belt to maybe put on your portfolio or something, then I don't want you to choose based on something you just want to do, unless it is a passion project. But but if it's not, and you're deciding on the project, 
I need you to decide what you're doing based on a problem that you could put your minds together to solve. I did a collaboration project after I graduated and the way we chose was just, I think it be, might be nice to do a project like this. And it is not on my portfolio. It is not going to be useful for any resume or anything or interview um, because we were not like educated well enough on what should be going in our portfolios and stuff like that. We just thought like, oh, maybe a project on this would be nice. Um, we should have brainstormed around what is a problem that we can solve instead. And that would have been way more useful um, to our job searching efforts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what about you, Zach? Do you have any closing comments, thoughts at all? Um, collaboration wise, if you're looking for collaboration projects, there's always like tech fleet or, um, it's always nice to go on and find UX or UI challenges on like LinkedIn. Cause those are usually, or even join one of the communities. Cause you will find people looking for people and it doesn't mean you have to take the first project you see. Um, it should be something like Will said that you're, you have interest in. Um, but also think about a, your personal branding and what you want to do later. Like what do you want to show in your portfolio for what your goal is in your career. So I wouldn't say take anything and everything, um, but definitely look for collaboration. Cause you know, I, I'm still doing personal projects outside of work and um, you never know who you'll find to collaborate with and it might open some doors later um, or just give you an experience that you'll never forget and maybe even learn something from. And as far as like picking your passion projects, honestly, you can do whatever you want. Like I said, I did the superhero thing. Is it useful in my portfolio? Mm, it could be. I guess it depends on where I'm applying. Like it's fun. Like it's a fun project. So if you want to show that in your portfolio, like, hey, look, I, I can come up with really creative solutions to really creative problems. Um like Will said, there are real life use case scenarios as far as like finding users to interview or as far as like the fire department or people who get emergency calls, like there is some kind of real world use for it. But even then you, you might be applying somewhere that does something a little more creative and they like seeing stuff like that in your portfolio. So it honestly doesn't matter what you pick and projects are not like the hardest thing to find you can walk down the street and find 10 different problems to solve um that's actually one good way to find freelance also by the way is go to your local stores look at their websites before you do it doesn't matter pick them apart do a entire analysis of everything and actually go to them and show them what you did i know it's free work and some people are against that but i mean if you had fun doing it and you learned something what's the harm in going to somebody and be like, Hey, so I looked at your website and here's what I did for you. Give it to them. Just give it to them. And who knows, maybe they'll call you back because they like it and they want to implement it. And it is working. You may or may not get jobs later, but it's something you can do. And those are things you can actually put in your portfolio. Like, yes, I did it for this company. No, they didn't hire me, but I did it and it's there. And even if it's just for experience, not everything has to go in your portfolio. Um, there's some projects I have that will never see my portfolio, but they were fun to do, or at least f for me, they were interesting, but yeah, um, they're definitely important because again, you can play with whatever styles you want. You're not held to any guidelines. It's your project. It's what you want to do. And, you know, maybe there's a UI kit out there you heard about and want to try or you think it'll fit something. Go for it. Use it on, on your idea. And, you know, you're only wasting your own time if you don't like how it looks later. And you can just use that as a learning experience and redo it. And that's what iterations are for. So, again, um, both are very important. And don't be scared to reach out to colleagues because I know there's a lot of um, boot camp grads and... You know, uh, I'm pretty sure any one of us would be willing to discuss a 
collaboration or even a couple ideas um, with people. Yeah, I definitely would. And I'll also uh, give my take on on collaboration. I mean, I I always I would recommend that yes, okay, it is good to collaborate with other people in your field, but I think it's actually also very advantageous to collaborate with people who have their own specialities. Um, I and uh, a, a colleague and friend of ours um, the one I worked with on the Classic Car app, she's a UI designer. Now, we both understand the fundamentals of UX of our opposite disciplines. Um, uh, but I would, I think it's actually better because you get to really understand their point of view, their way of thinking, the reason why they're doing what they do. So if you are out there and you want to collaborate... If you're a UX designer, for example, find a UI designer, find a developer, find someone with data analytics, have a, have the four of you working together, bringing your own individual strengths and compensating for your own individual holes in the knowledge of the other subjects. And I also think it makes for a better dynamic too, because I've always, I always believe that to get the best out of the different roles, you need to hire or work with i should say collaborate with people who are from the different roles i mean when we did the boot camp we weren't doing ux and ui we did ux with elements of ui ui designers who graduated from a boot camp did ui with elements of ux i'm sure developers learn a little bit about what ux and ui designers do because ultimately they're the ones in who are next in the pipeline and that's what I really recommend. Find people, especially if you're, even if you're still doing your boot camp course, find people in that course or not the course, but with the boot camp itself and work with them. And it will also give you better understanding of what the others do, which means that you will be able to adapt your ideas, perhaps adapt the way you do things and also realize that they see things differently than what you do. But I think that we are pretty much all in agreement that collaboration in design cannot be underestimated. It is the most important thing. Of course, you do also be, have to be able to work independently because you will not always be working in a team as it could be that someone needs to work on a specific thing. And that's why I would never believe that collaboration has to be more important than independent work. I don't think it has to be one's better than the other, one's worse. It just has to be a case of when to work independently, when to work collaboratively. And speaking of collaboration, we're collaborating with rounding this episode up for tonight. But as always, thank you very much for joining us. Again, please contact us, please message us uh, via the collective email. You can message us on LinkedIn. Um, I'm having a break from LinkedIn. But I, let, I made a post on there where you can contact me via my personal email. So please do so. Please get in touch. If you have any collaborator, any projects you wish to collaborate with us on, please get in touch and we'll be happy to get back to you. But from us here, from me, uh, Zach and Will, we wish you all a very good night. And again, we hope you've enjoyed it and that you've got something out of it. And we will be back with the next podcast. So take care, God bless, and good night.